Hey everyone, this is Dave Baton, co-founder and CMO at Doorloop. I'm going to be hosting this show today with our guest, Hugh Chen. He's originally from California with parents from Taiwan and has built a successful career in commercial real estate since graduating from the University of Florida. Hugh is the president of Sagal Companies, responsible for increasing their portfolio of properties by acquiring and developing shopping centers throughout Florida. He's also very active in the community and numerous charities and organizations. And today we're going to be discussing retail, commercial, real estate, and you is going to be making his case for getting involved in that space. And it's actually funny, I met you through a mutual friend, and he's always been a wealth of knowledge and always loved being at the forefront of technology. So with that being said, you welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, I'm glad to be on. I know you had told me about your uh, your podcast, so I'm excited to be a part of it now. Um, awesome. I'm actually uh, talking about something that uh, that's that's uh, and a segment of commercial real estate that I feel is a little bit more um, niche, I guess, than what maybe a lot of your audience is used to talking about, and that's shopping centers. Uh, yep. I, I I actually am part of um, uh, the FIU Masters of uh, Science and in International Real Estate, where I um, one day out of their semester, I helped teach a class, uh, along with Aliona Tuskova, who's our senior, uh, commercial real estate leasing person. Um, she graduated from FIU's MSIRE, uh, several years ago and, and the professors invite us on. So we're, I'm actually taking something that I spoke to the students of, uh, that program and talking to the, to your audience about, which is. A case for retail commercial real estate or shopping centers. <laughs> That's awesome. Excited to dive in. And before we dive straight in, let's give a quick, uh, maybe give some more background about information about yourself and what you're doing today. Sure. Um, so I have been involved in commercial real estate since the year 2000. I uh, studied finance at the University of Florida. And after graduating, um, I spoke with one of my friends who had already joined the business the year prior. And he told me about this world of uh, commercial real estate, specifically shopping centers. And I had no <laughs> idea. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, unless you are in the business, uh, how are you supposed to know there's a, something called a leasing agent that brings tenants to a shopping center? Right. Yeah. So it was pretty fascinating. And I um, uh, uh, wanted to give it a try. So I ended up looking for a job and finding one with Terranova Corporation out of Miami Beach. And that's where I got started. Um, the, the lady who, uh, who gave me my first opportunity is actually still very involved in our industry, Beth Azor. Wow. And she um, she's actually kind of a uh, uh, a legend now where she yeah, helps a I lot know of her. people. I know her. She helps a lot of people in the industry. So uh good, you know, good person to know. And, um, and I've been in shopping centers ever since, which was, which is pretty interesting. And, and I, you know, I, I know a little bit about the other food groups of commercial real estate. I mean, not, not enough to really talk intelligently about it, but, you know, enough to, to know, you know, know what they are. Um, but really, uh, we decided, or I decided to, to be a mile deep just in retail and in shopping centers. Um, from Terranova, uh, which was at the time uh, one of the largest third party leasing and management companies for shopping centers in the state of Florida. From Terranova, I uh, went to Woolbright Development. Mm. Uh, Woolbright Development. Uh, their business model was more of a merchant developer. So what that means is they would um, buy a shopping center that was undervalued and uh, lease it up, um, redevelop it, make it look very nice, and within a year or two sell it at a great profit uh, and then take the proceeds from that um, transaction and, and do it all over again. Yep. So I was with them for a number of years, and after that I... Uh, I, I spent about a year and a month with Ram Realty Partners 
out of uh, Palm Beach Gardens. And they um, developed both retail and residential. I worked on, on their retail division. Uh, but they were more of a fund model type of uh, commercial real estate company that would um, buy <clears throat> portfolios of shopping centers within a fund and operate them for a little bit longer term, uh, maybe more of a five to 10 year term. Um, so about 10 years ago, I joined Saglo Development, which is a family office. And uh, I joined Saglo <clears throat> after talking to Jack Lotman, who's the principal of Saglo. Um, uh, he had a actually called me to pick my brain about something else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to pick my brain about leasing, actually. Uh, not to try to hire me for leasing, but he was looking for a leasing agent at the time. And he wanted to know who I thought would be good for um, for his company. And we got to talking, uh, and um, I expressed interest in and in maybe doing something other than leasing. Uh, and, you know, long story short is I joined them as an acquisitions associate or uh, vice president of acquisitions. Um, and from there, I kind of uh, took on more responsibility and and uh, eventually uh, ran the entire company. Wow. Um, but the interesting thing about that is actually I met Jack uh, initially while working at Terra Nova, way back when my very first company. So I met him in about 2002 or 2003, and we just kept in touch for about a decade. Uh, so lesson learned is, you know, you never know where your next opportunity might come yep. from. It might be the guy that you met 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, a lot of the people that I knew, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago are in, you know, much different positions today. So you never, you know, don't burn any bridges and you never know yep. where your uh, next opportunity may come from. I love how your whole journey really just came around full circle till where you are today. It's amazing. And um, before we get into your slides, um, I just want to let everyone know this show is going to be published as both a podcast and a webinar version. So if you are tuning in now into our podcast, that's audio only, you can also watch the video version and see the slides that we have up on the screen as we walk through them. So with that being said, you take it away and tell us about what we're going to be covering today. Sure. Uh so a little bit about Saglo before we start. We own and operate shopping centers throughout the state of Florida and also now in Georgia. We're um, looking to expand into other states such as the Carolinas and uh, maybe Virginia, maybe Texas. So we're looking around. Um, all we own are shopping centers. And uh, spe spe specifically within shopping centers, uh, where we own really mostly class B, class C type of properties. Uh, think, you know, neighborhood strip centers, some grocery, some non-grocery, some discount anchored. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about who we are. And when I would speak with the, uh, the audience over at FIU's MSIRE program, <clears throat> um, a lot of the students, when I speak with them, uh, I get the feeling that the hot sectors of commercial real estate are really multifamily and industrial. Everybody wants to get into yep. multifamily. Everybody wants to get into industrial. Office is a little bit more out of favor right now. Um, actually, retail was the most out of favor for uh, a period of time, but I think now office is. Um, yep. Unless you Make own sense. in uh, Brickle or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, so this is really geared for, for that... Um, I guess, perspective where, hey, look, with multifamily, uh, it's it's pretty straightforward. You have um, apartment buildings of varying sizes. I think everyone's lived in an apartment at one point, so you kind of know what that is. Everyone signed a lease at, a lease at one point. Um, these uh, assets usually go for some of the lowest cap rates amongst the, the four food groups. You know, we're talking 4% cap rates. Uh, you know, uh, at today's debt levels, um, and you're talking one-year leases with mostly gross rents, and uh, and with uh, apartment buildings, um, neighborhoods matter, but not really like the specific corner. Like you know, with shopping centers, uh, the northwest corner of an intersection might be a lot better than the southeast corner, for example. Yep. 
Yep. So, so this is more neighborhood matters and, uh, and amenities and, you know, the condition of the, of the buildings are really the differentiator. That's, that's how one landlord can get more rent than another. Uh, with industrial, uh, with industrial type of buildings, we're talking warehouses and logistics centers, uh, manufacturing, uh, that's a pretty hot asset class right now, especially with, yep. um, a lot of the, uh, e-commerce and, uh, you know, server farms and all sorts of stuff. Uh, these are uh, longer term leases. So they're, not, they're not the one-year leases that the multifamily uh, asset group has. These are five plus year leases, but they're also uh, gross leases. And a lot of them have over the base year operating expense reimbursements. Uh, what, what have you seen uh, post-COVID that's changed with leasing or state of the market today? For, for retail specifically? Yep. So uh, so with uh, post-COVID, it, it's actually um, surprising. We've seen a, a huge uptick in leasing velocity after towards the end of 2020 and going into 2021. Yep. Um, specifically in Florida, and maybe some of the Sun Belt states. Uh, and I think what we attribute that to is a ton of domestic migration from states like California and New York yep. and Chicago and uh, Illinois uh, to Florida. And typically, when you see that type of population growth, you're going to see some pretty um, dramatic sales numbers from the tenants, and that drives demand for space and that drives uh, rental rates. And so yep. we've, we witnessed that. Uh, you add, add on top of that a lot of the stimulus money that just, you know. Uh, Free money. <laughs> increase sales, you know, that much more dramatically. Uh, I spoke with some retailers that would tell me uh, in some of these areas that we own in that are a little bit lower income areas, hey, look, uh, now the customers are coming in they're buying, they can't buy, I can't keep enough lobster and, and steak in, <laughs> in the deli department. And it's, it's a, it was a night and day difference. Great prompt to have today. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that has slowed down though. So I can tell you that um, it was a more of a, a curve that went up and I, and I think now it's a little bit tapering yeah. off right now. Agreed. Um, and, and so for the retail food group, uh, the, the cap rates are higher than industrial, higher than multifamily. Um, you have your five-year leases, but they're mostly triple net leases. And uh, the specific corner of the intersection really matters. And the leases are really complex um, the, because the co-tendency matters. So within the leases of the retail um Within the retail leases, there's all sorts of uh, provisions such as uh, co-tenancy clauses, um, opening co-tenancy, ongoing co-tenancy, exclusive use clauses, uh, use restrictions, and then you go into caps on cam and all of these other things, which I don't think that the other uh, leases go into as much. Right. So, so that's kind of the differentiator. Got it. Um, within retail, there's the subgroups. So you got your enclosed malls, your neighborhood strip centers, your street retail, and your regional power centers. We really focus in on the neighborhood strip centers. So if you think, you know, Publix or Winn-Dixie or, you know, even Save-A-Lot, that's, that's typically our anchor, maybe Big Lots or Marshalls or TJ Maxx. Um, a lot of the times the, the tenant mix is mostly essential uses or necessity uses. Uh, there's a mixture of national and, and local uh, tenants. So we deal, deal with a lot of mom and pops or, uh, you know, uh, companies with maybe two to 10 locations. Um, customer convenience is, is really important. And they typically draw from two to three miles uh, where enclosed malls are drawing from 15 to 20 miles. Street retail is, you know, uh, unique to the, those urban environments and the power centers draw from a little bit longer. 
Are you not seeing any, are you not seeing retail getting affected by online sales and e-commerce, Amazon? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I know that that was a big fear uh, over the last number of years, and maybe it still yep. is. Yep. And I think that that's what keeps the cap rates for retail a little bit higher than, uh, or a lot higher than, let's say, multifamily and industrial. Yep. Um, I think that online retail certainly has affected enclosed malls dramatically, um, power centers uh, quite a bit. Uh, I think Bed Bath & Beyond um, just filed bankruptcy this past weekend. So, uh, so wow, I so, did I did not know that. So that <laughs> uh, I think uh, there's a few others that are. Um, I think close. David, yeah, I think David's Bridal. There's some concerns over David's Bridal's longevity. Uh, but yeah, no, e-commerce has really taken a bite out of a lot of the um, retailers. Uh, you know, uh, business, I guess, uh, for, for what we do, um, we really try to focus on the necessity type of retail. So, uh, when you're dealing with a lot of medical and services and, and, you know, the, the deep discount retailers, um, a lot of that stuff really isn't online and, um, and we haven't been as affected. Uh, that being said, it's, you know, I'm sure that there's some, some effect there and we try to stay up to, up to date on the newest trends so that we're not caught off guard. Right. Um, you're mentioning a few terms that I want to clarify for some people that are new to commercial real estate, uh, or just new time investors in general. So if you can give some definitions for, uh, disc, let's start off with discount anchored. Sure. So, uh, discount anchored can be anything from. A thrift store, which we actually deal uh, deal with quite a few thrift stores. One of the ones that are in multiple centers of ours is called Red, White, and Blue, and we actually also do the tenant rep um, tenant representation for them. They are about a thirty to forty thousand square foot thrift thrift store that operates in twenty states across the United States, wow. and they have an incredible operations. Uh, when you go in, it looks like it looks like a TJ Maxx or a Marshalls and that everything's organized and it's clean and it's well lit. Um, the the, the uh, amount of staff that's there is incredible and you can find things pretty, you know, pretty easily. Everything's color coded, everything's, you know, organized by size. Wow. And when you go there, you're uh, able to buy, you know, pants for less than $10, uh, a jacket for less than $10. So, when you're when you're dealing with that type of product, um, uh, and by the way, they call that uh, treasure hunting or something like that. That's the that's the phenomenon <laughs> that kind of keeps customers coming back and, yeah. and has the have them uh, has them traveling from 20, 30 miles away. Wow, uh, that's kind of hard to recreate online. So that yeah. you know that would be this deep discount. Uh, Big Lots is also a discount, and I don't believe that they have much of an online presence, if any. Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, yep. um, you know that type of retail. I, I feel is somewhat uh, insulated from e-commerce. Got it. Okay, so if someone was just getting started and wanted something safe, what, as you call it, what food group would you recommend they go into? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, within shop, within retail, I know that one of the uh, very popular subgroups is your single tenant net lease, your triple net deals. Yep. And what's nice about them is that they're very hands off from a management standpoint. Um, so for example, an example of that would be if you were to buy a Chick-fil-A, I think that's like the gold standard, like the chance. So you buy the Chick-fil-A and it's a single tenant net lease deal. All you do is collect the rent the tenant themselves, they handle paying the real estate taxes and the insurance and they insure their own building and they clean up their own parcel and you don't really need to deal with them too much. Uh, and the chances that you're going to get the rent every month are pretty high because let's say it's Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or um, I don't know, Wawa, for example, or yep. Walgreens. Uh, so they're, uh, the chance that you're going to get the rent is pretty high. 
but they trade at a pretty low cap rate. So that, that cap rate is still, um, you know, higher than let's say multifamily, but it's the lowest of all of the retail subgroups, right. uh, with, you know, with the neighborhood shopping centers, uh, why, why we're bullish on that is we feel like that's got a pretty good risk adjusted return where if you're able to buy, um, a strip center with a number of tenants that are, you know, somewhat, uh, e-commerce resistant or uh, that has a lot of essential uses for uh, let's say a six and a half or a seven percent cap rate and uh, you could you could put your money in that uh, or let's say you can you uh, were to uh, put your money in multifamily at a four or four and a half percent cap rate that's a big difference yep. that's a big difference in in yield um and the question is, is, is that strip center that much more risky that, uh, that, that type of yield would, you know, um, where, where it match that type of, that yield would uh, match that type of risk. Right. I don't, I don't think that it, that it is. Uh, so we, we've been in business for about 47 years and we've had strip centers for all 47 years. And I mean, even in the great financial crisis and uh, the shutdowns, they've been humming along uh, great. I mean, it's not to say that they've never had any speed bumps, um, but I think every asset class has. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm pretty bullish on right now on strip centers, and that's really what we're looking at right now. Um, well, I mean, during during COVID, what I remember happening, even for my own investments, was tenants couldn't pay rent. So then landlords had to be creative and defer rent, but then some tenants could also apply for stimulus and the landlords were even helping them. So at the end of the day, you got paid. It might not have been in full right away, but eventually you made up for the losses and lost time. Is that correct? Yeah, that, absolutely. For the most part. Uh, so we have about 450 tenants and I think we lost one or two during the COVID shutdowns. It's incredible. Uh, everybody else, we we either worked with them in some way or they were they were an essential use so they 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 actually weren't affected at all so they were just fine um but we ended up collecting close to uh 99 of all the rents uh that's uh, maybe, incredible maybe almost 100 percent of the rents. so you know knock yeah on wood, you might be think, a unicorn example <laughs> but, but but from from my understanding people made out pretty good you you might think that they'd all be closed and going out of business but not the case yeah yeah yeah, a a absolutely. Um, you know, I think that I think that we're unique because we're in Florida. Um, I know that we have uh, friends in the business that own in other states, and I don't think all of the states saw what we saw. So, yeah. you know, a little bit of luck played into that. Yeah, um, for for sure. You know why for, why is mm -hmm. why are you trying to go outside of Florida now though? Well. Um, we want diversity and geography also. I don't want all of my eggs in, in the Florida basket. Uh, yeah. Number one, it, the insurance is very high here. I don't know, you know how many. Why? Are there hurricanes or anything? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, just, a, just a little bit of a breeze here and there. Yeah, um, yeah. There's very few insurance companies left in Florida. Yeah, our, our uh, insurance costs have increased dramatically. Yeah, uh, but they could it could have been worse because you know just uh, ten years ago we were almost entirely um, invested in only in South Florida, and now we're oh, wow. throughout the whole state. Uh, we're in Atlanta, and we love to be in uh, Texas and the Carolinas just to have a little bit more diversity in that geography. Yeah, uh, and you know. I think there's a lot of great cities out there to uh, to invest in. I mean, really, that's what we we invest in when we're when we're looking at a new market. Uh, we really have to be convinced that uh, it's a market that is going to uh, continue to grow in the future. That has job creators where that's going to lead people to you know move to those markets. And uh, as people move to the markets, that's that's where retail can really thrive. Um, so we're looking at uh, Huntsville, which I think is already, you know, the word's already out, secret's out there. Um, <laughs> uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, Asheville, Charlotte, Raleigh, 
Yep. Um, we're looking at uh, Dallas and San Antonio, um, <clears throat> Greenville. So, so several, you know, really, really cool towns. Yeah, really it cool sounds cities. like the key. The key lesson here is don't put your eggs in one basket. Diversify as much as you can across all portfolio types, maybe even or just location. I mean, you you do a little bit of well. Would you say you diversified in portfolio types? Uh, I would say that. Mm. You mean, like we we might look at some more power type of centers. I mean, we're not really, um, we're we're not really uh, looking at street retail. We're not really we're not looking right. at single tenant net lease. Um, we're not really looking at malls, although some of these mall cap rates are pretty high. <laughs> but but yep. I think that's because they're really hard to finance right now. Yeah. Um, so what you're saying is you're focusing on your niche market your specific expertise yeah yeah we you know that's what we know uh we've been successful at it um you know it's uh, uh you know I'm, uh, the slide that i have up now is called um barriers to entry yeah let's get into that it's, yeah you know and, and that's kind of the reason it, it's because it's retail it's it's um especially what we do it's pretty difficult uh it's complex um i feel like you do a lot of work for it, yep. uh, and and that's really your your moat. You know, it's right that 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 keeps that keeps your competition out. And a lot of people don't want to do retail for all of those reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so because of that, we figured, okay, you know, if we know retail very well, why don't we just stick with that? And that's been successful for, sure. for us in the past, and I'm sure it'll be uh, fine in the future. No, oh, and you've written out the dot com boom, oh nine, two thousand twenty. I mean, you've written out a few, a few busts over here. So uh, you're 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 going the right direction. You guys are doing things just fine, I think. Yep, absolutely. Um, so on on this slide here, because uh, I know you're on uh, here. This is also a podcast, and not everyone will be able to see it. But I listed out a number of bullet points on things that are uh, unique to retail. So, for example, uh, we have the triple net lease. So, which what that means is that um, our tenants are billed separately, their base rent, and then their operating expenses. And their base rent, uh, more or less, is pretty predictable. Uh, usually, it's either uh, growing by three percent a year, or maybe just CPI, or maybe a combination of three percent or CPI. But the operating expenses can go up and down depending on um, what those costs actually are. And, uh, like I mentioned, insurance has gone up quite a bit. Uh, so this year our insurance ex line item expense has gone up quite a bit, uh, as our, uh, for our expense reimbursements. So the good news is that, um, as our expenses go up and down, we're going to get that reimbursed. So it's going to be more, more or less, uh, you know, uh, not as much of an effect on us as compared to, right. let's say, apartment buildings. Yeah, break even. Yeah. yeah. So if you're an apartment building owner, uh, that increase in insurance, I mean, until the next renewal, you can try to um, increase the rents to offset it. But, you know, it's uh, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned, you know, co-tenancy is really... Uh, important in shopping centers uh, because there's some synergy there. Like, for example, uh, if you if you have a, a property with um, uh, with TJ Maxx, for example, <clears throat> if you focus on um, the customer, so the TJ Maxx customer are typically uh, women, uh, they're coming in with the mindset already of shopping for soft goods, you know, clothing, furniture, accessories, something like that. Yep. Um, so that's your anchor. And if you were to put, let's say, a shoe store next to them and next to them maybe a, a, a med spa and a day spa and a, and a hair salon, it's all catering to the same uh, customer base. And so you get synergy from there um, and that as you continue to um, bring in more and more of that same customer, in this case, it would be the the female shopper that um, 
is looking to spend money on on uh, on goods, um, it it, it kind of reinforces itself that traffic, so it builds on itself. Meaning, uh, so as you become more of a destination for that shopper, then you can bring in other uh, retailers that also cater to that shopper. And then at, at uh, some point, you can start charging a little bit more rent as you have more traffic. Makes total sense. And I'm assuming before you obviously start even filling your first you know, lease out, you're looking at demographics, population, population growth before you even get into that shopping center and acquire it. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a science behind it. Um, yeah. and, and you know, technology today, uh, it's, it's been pretty amazing. We use um, a software called Placer AI which I don't uh, know if you've heard of it before, but no. they, uh, they, uh, they are a data company that um, takes uh, uh, geo, uh, geolocation data and compiles it and, make, and gives you something that you can work with. So using Placer AI, uh, we can see if there is more foot traffic going into one store versus mm -hmm. another store. Cool. And uh, not only that, we can see, you know, uh, what type of customers are actually going to the property as opposed to just what type of uh, customers live around the property. So are you saying they're taking data from, let's say, Google Maps, which knows where you're going, what directions you're looking for, and they can tell you based on that? They're, they're taking um, data from cell phones, actually. So a lot of your uh, cell phones, a lot of cell phones out there has um, have applications that you grant uh, access to your location to your location data, I guess. And so uh, then in your terms and services, it says that they can use that location data yeah. and, you for know, third party and goodbye. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, not not that they're tracking you as a person, like they're it's not tracking anonymous. you know Hugh right. or David, uh, but they're. Right looking at patterns at, at large right. data patterns and by using that you can determine hey you know um where is your real trade area so if you own a shopping center and uh right next to a, a train tracks i mean are you really drawing from the other side of the tracks or not right. and by going to placer ai you can really see if that's the case or wow. you can even see hey you know um we own this winn dixie shopping center in Amelia Island, uh, is there any cross traffic with the Publix? I mean, are people going to Winn-Dixie and Publix and using that uh, technology you can see, oh yeah, no, there's quite a bit of cross traffic between Publix and Winn-Dixie or, um, you know, Walmart and Publix or whatever. You could just ask me. My wife always does uh, does both. There we go. There's your data. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's amazing what technology has uh, allowed us to do, but but no, we look at, you know, uh, house, average household incomes. We look at the population density and population growth um, as a percentage. Uh, we look at uh, average age and, uh, you know, we even look, in some cases, we'll look and see if uh, the percentage of the people that live around there, are they mostly uh, owners of their homes or are they renters? Because that's, yep. there's, there's a difference there. Yep. There's so many metrics. And I'm assuming you're preparing a presentation for the investors before you acquire anything, obviously. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a little bit of the secret sauce. So I don't, I can't disclose too much, but there's, <laughs> there's, um, Argus. You know, many, 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 <laughs> many data points that we look yeah. at before we buy a property and we do use Argus. So we're pretty, we're a pretty technology forward company. Yeah, I love that. I love that. every time I speak to right. you every few months, there's always a new some new tool you're using and you're always so curious, what are we using? Well, how can we use it? Which is which is so cool. And there's so much new technology coming out. It's it's unreal how fast this world is moving, especially in the direction of AI that you've probably seen. I mean, ChatGPT, we could have a whole webinar just on that. Yep. Um yeah, that's 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 something that I don't know enough about to you talk intelligently about and I'm start, yeah. just starting to use it. Uh, you know, between that and I think Google has their own version called Bard and yep, yep. another company has their own version. So yep. I think the adoption of that is going to be much, much quicker than what people think. For sure. I mean, yeah. it's already being integrated into so many tools, even that we use today for everything, customer support. I mean, everything 
uh, onboarding, hiring. There's tons of AI tools that we're using internally. Um, it's making the job easier. We're doing a better job at it, and it's letting us get more done in less time with great results. So it's it's been a game changer for us and, and for our business internally. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see where, where, where it takes us. I'm, I'm a little, uh, you know, I'm excited. And, but cautious. And, may, and maybe <laughs> maybe I'll make our uh, this type of work a lot easier, you know. AI can just kind of spit out which properties we should buy and at how much uh, that would be perfect. <laughs> one day, one day. But then everyone can do it. There goes your barrier to entry. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, on the bullet points of unique to retail, you know, one of the things that's really unique to retail is that the location um, where the transaction takes place is, is – uh, you know, and, and and this is where kind of e-commerce kind of changes it a little bit. But historically, retail is that's where the transaction took place. It was at the store. That's where the customer came, and you had to cash register, and uh, that's where it happened. So it, it was that much more important. Yeah, uh, uh, and hard to be hard to replicate. You know, and yeah, uh, and you had to be on a major road, uh, and you had to be easy to find and easy to get into. With, with e-commerce, it definitely changes things quite a bit where now things are uh, delivered to you. But if you have a lot of essential uses like a uh, doctor's office and um, beauty salons and uh, dry cleaners, then, you know, that all of that still holds true. That's where the transaction happens and that's where the service happens. Right. Um, the, uh, the fact that shopping centers more or less have to be on major roads and they're low um they're low density right so they're on major thoroughfares but they're uh mostly mostly parking lots if you yeah. think about it a shopping center is about a quarter like the building itself is about a, a qu quarter of the land and three quarters of the land are shopping centers and landscaping and drainage and everything else Parking lots, you're saying three quarters are parking lots. Three, 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 three yeah. quarters are parking lots. Yeah. Uh, so that makes it a little bit unique in that um, they're uh, what do you call it? Uh, you, you can do a lot with it. You know, there you you could um, where where let's just say an office building that's ten stories uh, high, you know, might be on I don't know two acres or three yep. acres. Um, if you took the square footage of the office building and if that, if that was a shopping center, maybe that would be the equivalent of 20 acres, right? And on a major thoroughfare. So once you have that much land on a major thoroughfare, you can do a lot with it. And I think you're seeing that right now. You're seeing that there's a lot of, um, redevelopment into mixed use. You're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of, uh, shopping centers getting, uh, part of it getting demolished and going vertical and you're seeing some apartment buildings uh maybe even hotels getting put in its place why is that i think that um housing is still in uh, uh in there there's an undersupply of housing still and so especially down here so where there is such a demand in housing, I think wherever you can find land to develop into multifamily, uh, you're going to have some interest from a developer. And Got I it. think that um, as the really easy lots are taken up where, you know, it's just grass or dirt, <laughs> yeah. um, as, as those are harder and harder to come by, these uh, shopping centers are almost like the next best thing. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cool. Uh -uh. Um, and for for a while, these uh, shopping centers had the highest yields out of the other asset classes. So, right. I think that we like we like yield. Yeah. Uh, so when name the, of the game. Yeah. So when we're in, uh, evaluating a shopping center, uh, we talked about we're really looking at the neighborhood, the population growth, the job generators, uh, where is the retail nodes, uh, the types of tenants in the area. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, uh, accessibility, visibility, uh, the topography sometimes. Uh, not so much in South Florida, but if you get into some other states, sometimes a shopping, uh, a shopping center might be uh, 
way below street level or, or way above street level. Um, we look at the rent roll, uh, the, the expiration dates make a, uh, a big difference on how safe an asset is or not. Right. Um, and just to clarify, expiration dates for the lease is coming up. For the lease, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So, you yeah. know. The, so how many you have to renew, basically. Yeah, yeah. So if, you, if you're if you buying a public center, does that public's um, lease expire next year or in 10 years? So that, that makes right. a big difference. But it's my understanding that if it is expiring in the very near term, you have the ability to find out or start. Uh, I don't know if you can negotiate with them, but they kind of already are pre-negotiating, so to put some ease in the deal. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Um, so, so if, uh, if an anchor tenant has a lease expiration coming up within 12 months and that seller decided to put the property out to market before, um, uh, before renewing them, right. it always makes us think like, well, why didn't they just renew them and then put right. the property out right. to sell? What's the story? What's the story there? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, but yes, I mean, you can certainly in a, in a, during your due diligence period, kind of figure out if, um, if that tenant plans on renewing or not. Got it. <clears throat> we look at the financials, uh, expense reimbursement ratio. We look at the historic vacancy. Um, we look at the, the, uh, delinquency report. Uh, and then we look at, you know, some of those, uh, finance ratios, the IRR, the CAGR, um, the, you know, we look at what kind of debt we can get in the market and what's our uh, debt service coverage ratio. So to me, what I'm hearing is if you're, if you're new to this and you're listening to this or watching this, it's going to be very difficult for you to do this by yourself, obviously. So probably work for another company, build your own company or, or grow. Uh, and then two, if you are already doing this, is there any special thing? piece of advice you can give regarding this slide of evaluating anything someone might not be looking or overlooking that they should be looking into more? Yes. So if you're looking to redevelop a shopping center, uh, you got to just make sure that you understand how much rights that the anchor tenants or the tenants have in general. Um, I think a lot of the people that aren't in shopping centers don't realize how much rights the tenants have here. Meaning that uh, if you have an anchor tenant like TJ Maxx, a lot of the times they'll tell you, you can't change, you know, this part of the property or, or the property at all. So you, you have, you, you cannot redevelop it. And then at that point you have to talk to, um, that tenant and see if you can work something out with them. So I would just say, pay attention to that if you plan on redeveloping a property. So these are rights that the, the tenant has and the landlord have agreed to previously in their original contract lease it, agreement yeah and, and and it's to protect the tenant also i mean if the yep. if the uh tj max is going into the property uh, based on the way that the property is configured and the tenants that are there at that time you know that's what they that's what they bought essentially exactly they, exactly that's what they like so yeah. if you they don't provide, want a competitor coming up next door basically if you can provide something that's even more attractive then i think that generally they're pretty open to it but they just don't want to be in a situation that they're in a worse off property at the end of the day. Yep. Makes sense. <clears throat> so uh, one of the shopping centers that we bought uh, pretty early on at Saglo or went out uh, with uh, my time at Saglo was in 2015, we bought a shopping center. So this is a case study uh, where I'm giving you a case study uh, it's a shopping center that we bought in 2015 called Florida and Waters. Uh, we it's in the Tampa market. We since renamed it to Seminole Heights Plaza uh, because Florida and Waters just didn't didn't sound <laughs> quite quite as good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so so this shopping center we actually bought through a 1031 exchange. We uh, bought a property in 2013 and sold, sold it, it in 2015. So we bought the property in 2013 for $4.4 million. We sold it in 2015 for $6.45 million and then did a 1031 exchange into uh, Florida Waters Shopping Center uh, that we bought for $8.25 million. And so we had to put a little bit more money in, not, not a whole lot. Uh, but most recently... 
the most recent um, appraisal, uh, we actually had the property appraised at uh, fourteen point three million dollars in twenty nineteen. Wow. Incredible. And we did a cash out refi. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure today that would probably be closer to sixteen million or something like that. But this is a good example of um, where you could buy a property for four point four million dollars, uh, put sixty five percent loan to value uh, on on that acquisition, so that your equity is one point five four million. So you cut you cut a check for one point five four million, and yep. you own that shopping center. Then you sell yep. it, and you roll the three point six million of equity that it turned into into the next shopping center, and then in 2019, that that equity ends up being 9.65 million, all you know, from, all from the 1.4 original. All, all yeah, exactly, yeah. and that's really that wealth creation process, that value creation, and you know, real estate's one of the those asset groups that you you can leverage, you could uh, depreciate while it's appreciating, which is uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> oh, wow, I I love that line. Um, I love that. <laughs> and, and, you know, certainly we've taken a, advantage of the depreciation that, uh, you know, uh, that, that's been available. Yep. Um, and, and then, you know, you get your annual yield. It's, it's high yep. yielding. So, uh, yep. shopping centers, at least that part of it. So, so this was, and uh, the investors get their K1s with the distributions and 0% tax. Everything's been written off and, uh, depreciated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's been, it's been yep. great. Um, so Florida and Waters has been in one of our uh, great case studies on how to do it right. And let's talk about the investors for a second. Who are the investors? Normal people um, or anyone with over a million in assets or institutions? So Florida and Waters actually is, is ju just uh, just us internally, uh, this, this okay. particular one. we With CBS Plaza in 2013, our intent was to bring in outside money um, to uh, to invest into the deal, friends and family, really. Right. But uh, because that was our very first uh, acquisition, and by the time we um, kind of got the documents right and figured it, figured it out, it, it had already been over a year. So we said, all right, we're just going to keep this yeah. one in-house. Yeah. But today you have accredited investors also? Yes, we do. Uh, okay. We have... We have um, something on the magnitude of like 150 to 160 different accredited investors yeah. uh, across all of the uh, funds and investments that we have. And, and when all you're friends and family money. So when you said fund, are you, are they investing in a portfolio, like 12 properties in the next five years you're going to acquire, or is every single deal a different investment, different uh, fundraise? Starting in 2019, we started um, more of a fund model because prior to then we were uh, just buying uh, one property or two properties at a time and then raising the money with those one or two properties. Yeah, it's so much work. And also the investor doesn't get the diversification. That's right. And so in 2019, we decided, hey, let's uh, put together a fund. Um, and uh, our initial target raise was going to be uh, for $35 million. But um, the two properties that we we're going to buy to close out that fund, uh, we we're going to close in 2020. Um, and, you know, those Ooh. got delayed. And so yeah. we ended up just closing that uh, 2019 fund off at like 20, I don't know, 25 million or so yep. uh, with three properties. And then in 2021, uh, we started a $40 million fund that um, was seeded by those couple of properties that were supposed to be in the 2019 fund, but got so delayed that they ended up going into the 2021 fund. Uh, plus we bought four other properties. So that ended up being six properties in, in that 2021 fund. And wow. then we're uh, going to be um, starting another fund uh, later this year uh, that's going to uh, end up buying you know, six to eight properties throughout oh, the great. Southeast. So, so that's kind of been our, I guess, our, our way of doing it. Uh, and it's become, um, you know, uh, like you said, ge geograph uh, both geographically and you know, shopping center wise, you got a, a lot of diversity, so you don't have uh, one 
tenant, you know, as 60% of your income, which is a little bit scary sometimes. Yep. Uh, the largest tenant might be, I don't know, 10, 12% of your portfolio. So it's not too bad. And if someone is tuning in, are they able to invest with Saglo or is it only pretty much referrals and right now it's pretty much oversold? Uh, uh, no, no, it's not oversold yet. Um, uh, so we're, we're bringing in, I have to be careful cause we're, uh, we're, 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 um, the reg D rule 506 B as opposed to 506 C, <laughs> which means I can't generally solicit. So okay. I'm not going to be generally soliciting for funds, okay. but, but it's not oversold and we're still raising money for it. Okay. Understood. So I, I can solicit for you if you're interested, yeah. contact, and, and, contact. And, and, that's and not he, the point of it. It's not the point of this class, but if you're interested, contact you even for, I mean, I know that you just, you just love giving advice. You love helping out and giving others and even mentoring. So I'm assuming that if anyone has questions, they could just reach out on LinkedIn and, and, and message you. Yep. If anyone has questions, uh, happy to answer them. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, so uh, actually our, our second, uh, so I, I said CBS Plaza was our first property. Um, and we didn't get to bring in outside money for it. But Sunpoint, which is my other case study, uh, that was actually uh, one of the two properties that we bought in 2014 that we were able to bring in outside money. And uh, interestingly enough, um, I mentioned uh, the Regulation D, Rule 506B uh, and 506C. Uh, Sunpoint, we brought in um, some equity through crowdfunding and crowdfunding had just started like a year or two prior to that. So, so this is really early on in that uh, crowdfunding mechanism of raising money. Yep. So this property, some point, is in the Tampa market. It's in Ruskin. Uh, we bought that for um, seven and a quarter million dollars in 2014. And it's a 132,000 square foot shopping center. Wow. Uh, so we put 65% uh, loaned the value on it. So our equity was uh, $2.5 million. We um, repainted the property. We leased up the vacancy. We replaced uh, a 30,000 square foot church with a, with a higher paying church. Um, and in 2020, uh, this property was appraised for $13 million. Um, and we did incredible. a cash out refi. So yep. what was initially a $2.5 million uh, equity ended up being closer to eight and a quarter million dollars of equity. Uh, just a few years later. And Incredible. so that's your your value creation and your wealth building. And I think you have a slide on this. I know we have a few minutes left only, but we have a lot more. We can we can keep going for hours. So uh, maybe hit us like the last two or three best slides. All right. Adding value, the next one. I mean, that's what we were talking about. Yeah, adding value. Sure. All right. So adding value. Um so uh, increasing the value of your shopping center, it can occur through a combination of things. Uh, you can increase your gross revenue by leasing up the vacancies or replacing uh, tenants that are under market rents that have under market rents with, with market rents. Yep. You can decrease your expenses and increase your expense reimburs uh, reimbursement ratio, you basically increase your operational efficiency. That's going to get you some uh, higher value and at your property uh you can lower the cap rate um which is kind of out of your control but some of it is within your control like i mentioned uh before the tenant mix makes a lot of difference so you're going to have a lower cap rate for a Publix uh and at your property versus a save a lot for example so if right. you bring in um more desirable tenants that's going to lower your cap rate uh, you can expand the property. Uh, you can redevelop um, the property to multifamily or even self storage. I've seen it. Uh, bring in I, a hotel. I'm, I'm not so familiar with expanding a property. How do you do that? You just acquire the adjacent lot. <clears throat> uh, well, we actually just bought a property in the Melbourne area um, that had uh, that that's that's a 50,000 square foot fresh market property that actually has uh, about one and a half acres of land that you could just uh, build the expansion. The, the sellers uh, uh, got it. didn't, um, you know, never did it, but we think that there's an ability to do that later on. So it's just expanding the property. And, and you're obviously looking at the zoning restrictions or whatever it's zoned for already before you acquire it. Yep. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, you know, uh, we're not buying it with leases in place or anything. So there's a lot of speculation there and, and there's a lot right. of assumptions, but we think we can do something with it. Great. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what we do. And uh, I have other slides that uh, talk, go more in, de in depth into how to increase income and, you know, examples of operational efficiency. And um, there's talks about uh, ways that cap rates can get lowered uh, and a little bit about expansion or, and redevelopment. But I think that, you know, if anyone has questions, they can certainly reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer. Awesome. And uh, for those tuning into the podcast, Hugh just uh, scrolled through some of those slides at the end. So if you do want to check them out, there is a lot of value. I mean, we we can easily keep going for another hour uh, just in those four or five slides alone. So definitely check it out and you could you know, save them, screenshot them, whatever you like. And for you, where can people contact you or follow you online? LinkedIn? Uh, sure. Uh, LinkedIn's probably the best place. Um, I'm pretty active on it. So if you go to LinkedIn, look for Hugh Chen. Um, I think there might be only one that is in commercial real estate that's in Florida, uh, but look for me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. You, thank you so much again for joining us. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, David. This is great. Yeah, it was fun. And for everyone tuning in, don't forget you can go to doorloop.com slash webinars or doorloop.com slash podcast to see all of our other episodes or join future episodes and to also watch the recording and the video and the slides where we're going to share everything over there, including a transcript of everything if you ever want to search through it. Thank you again. That wraps it up for today, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.